we're going to look at the building and the inspection of parts within an 11 inch style stamped steel three lever long style adjustable clutch. Of course the base is going to be started with the flywheel. In this case we're using an aluminum segmented flywheel. By allowing it to have an aluminum flywheel with inserts that are segment and bolt through rather than rivet on, we allow for the expansion and contraction throughout the heat dissipation and the cycles that it's going to see throughout its use. Here we have an aluminum segmented pressure ring. You'll notice that this style has the aluminum lugs that are actually machined into it rather than what you'll see in some of our next gen style clutches where it actually has a bolt through billet steel style. These here are actually really great as far as for an ease of manufacturing and they've been around for a long time and serve their purpose. The most important thing to look at is actually look at your pin head and how much material that is any time given between the facing and the pin. That's, the most, that's one of the most structurally important parts. The other part to look at is down here at the very base where it's machined to make sure you don't get any cracks or any information, anything that starts to come in there as that can be a trouble spot. However, these are all made of 70-75 grade aluminum which is very important once again upon the heat dissipation as well as the strength of a material. You'll notice that this clutch here actually also has segmenting done as well as the old style, uh, or as the new style next gens have. By doing this, once again, we're allowing for the expansion and contraction throughout the time so that that way, what you're used to seeing with the old style, with the one piece rivet on heat shields, you'll see a brass uh, rivet holding on a steel one piece heat shield to an aluminum uh, pressure ring or flywheel. And the problem with that basically is that you have three different materials or three different metals doing. Uh, uh, the same thing but at a different rate. They have a different rate of expansion and contraction and heat dissipation so basically the brass rivet is going to swell and contract quicker than the steel counterpart of it as well as the aluminum which causes for a lot of times not necessarily that the heat shield itself will work but sometimes that the brass um, will actually pull away so that the the, the the, pre the heat shield onto the pressuring or the flywheel is actually starting to pull up and cut prematurely. However, that being said, sometimes uh, a revision to that has been steel in the past, and you know, steel rivet. The problem with that technically or usually has been that if something's going to give or move, then at that point it's usually going to be that it pulls through and puts extra pressure on the aluminum pressuring, which because becomes a little bit of a problem in and of itself again. However, to go back to the, uh, the design of this is what you have to look at is the lever styles. The lever style that you'll see normally will be a, um, an adjustable or a lever like this. You'll notice that this lever here has two holes on the inside. This is our design lever, which we call the divination lever. This lever is a little bit more advanced in technology as far as how it's been tested with the dyno. We've spent a lot of time with our in-house dyno information trying to figure out exactly the applied pressure that you're going to see. And of course, you're all used to this hole out here being where you're going to add or subtract your counterweight for the centrifugal pressure. By allowing these holes inside, we can actually slow down or control, I should say, the amount of applied pressure that we see at any given time. The other advantage, or I should say maybe um, improvement that we've made over the years in comparison to the older style lever, which most people are used to seeing, is this is an older style billet lever, which is very common. Um, there's several different people who have made this style lever over the years. Um, we have, however, been able to make an improvement, and it really just has to do with geometry and understanding the information, and for years nobody really spent time putting one of these style clutches on a dyno, let alone making a lot of uh, pulls and a lot of changes and you know, really documenting them and making, making the improvements. The hole that you see towards the inside on these is actually a machining fixture, whereas what we've gone and done with our divination lever, with the two, lever, the two holes that you see, is actually, they're actually placed there and the contour of it is changed. It's hard to see in, in the video probably, but we actually have weight in different places. You'll notice the longer flat spot before the ramp versus the older style lever. And all this has to do with the balancing and the, the geometry of the lever. So even though the naked eye, a lot of times they look very similar, how much weight is placed in different places really makes a difference on how they react. The biggest change that you'll find is the back hole on the old style levers are generally elongated. You'll notice that that back hole is fairly long. The, this is something that was done for years basically to counteract the, um, the over centering, or I should say, or the binding uh, within the yoke uh, up against the pressuring stands themselves. 
So it actually causes a problem on the dyno, which we've noticed, or it caused a problem, in, I should say, throughout its uh, RPM cycle. And we see it on the dyno in that it actually has a little bit of a check mark. So when we're ramping it up, the numbers that I usually tell everybody is that it's usually between 6,000 and 6,800 RPM. We'll see what we call a check mark. That means it loses pressure momentarily. Sometimes that pressure will be lost for uh, 100 RPM. Sometimes it'll be lost for three or 400 RPM. Sometimes it'll lose uh, 50 R or sorry, 50 pounds of pressure. Sometimes it'll lose 300 pounds of pressure. And where it starts is a difference. And the reason for that long that is because of the elongated black back hole and the, the geometry. So it doesn't start and stop at exactly the same point. And it takes the centrifugal moment of inertia to break over in order to free it up. So that 6,000 to 7,000 RPM area is very, very important to most of the guys running this style of clutch. That's their typical operating area. So it's important to, to change that. We've been able to modify that and put the, the, the basically put the, the holes where they need to be, modify yokes and modify different things so that you have an easy application of pressure over time. And it does the same thing every time because we know that you know repeatability when you're with the, with the clutch is one of the most important things because if you make a change somewhere else and you don't know what, it got, what got you there, that's very important. So the next step, of course, after this is going to be to continue assembling is going to be we're going to install the levers and then we're going to install the springs, the cover, and do all the setup height, which we'll cover next. However, the first thing to look at, we have already assembled our levers with the yoke in them. You'll see that there are a couple different styles. This is the older style that still uses a press-in pin with a cotter pin on the back side. This is actually a fine use for most applications. Um, the only thing that we've ever seen as any kind of a problem is sometimes a very, very high RPM application sometimes can be a little harder on them through the vibration and some other things, but generally speaking, this has been fine. In the later models and some of the stuff like what we do now with our next gen and other applications, we actually have designed that the yoke pin is actually encapsulated throughout the, the lever stands themselves on the pressure ring, which basically negates the need for a locking pin on either side. So that's kind of an upgrade that we've built to, and it's something we've looked at possibly integrating into these pressure rings as well in the coming future. Um, however, this is something that most people have in their trailers and they have spare parts, so it's something we've been a little bit hesitant to change, just so that in case there's ever a problem, there's no big changes that'll keep them from the next race. Okay, now that we have our levers and our yokes installed, the one thing to keep in mind is that there are several different components. On these style clutches, you'll find that there's a bushing used in between the lever and the pin and the yoke and the lever as well here on that pin. So you need to make sure that you keep an eye on those. The one thing that these are subject to do with that style, you can have them break or fracture or things happen over time. Once again, usually through the heat cycles. Also, clutch dust will have a tendency to build up in those locations. Keeping everything clean makes a, a big difference. It's just like any other component, you know, stay on top of that. Uh, the best thing to do really is to just blow it out once in a while, use air. Uh, the only time that you want to use any types of cleaners or anything like that is going to be when you have it completely fully disassembled. You don't want to spray a cleaner or anything in like this simply because sometimes what it'll do is actually make the dust particles actually pile up and build when it dries and they'll be in a place that causes more damage than it would have before. But those bushings are something you need to watch anytime you have a problem. I talked earlier about the ability for the lockup or the longevity or the elongated back hole and why we don't do it anymore. You'll notice that this lever here has a if the if this stays where it would be affixed to normally, it travels up and down just fine without any sort of binding or anything like that. So we basically you know engineered that part of it out with the with the geometry of the lever style and things like that. So it's not something you have to worry about. But while the clutch is in this state, I want to take a moment to explain why we set our lever heights. Once the cover goes on and everything's installed, why we do what we do in, our, in terms of making sure these are correct. Of course, when we set the lever height, when everything goes, that means basically how it's shimmed or where it's set in the cover from start. You've got to make sure, you want to make sure that every single lever when you're ready is basically exactly the same height. We stand to within about five to seven thousandths of, a, of an inch, basically, um, is where our accepted tolerance is at. That'll make sure that the bearing is going to contact all the levers at about exactly the same time. So, you know, that's mostly that's one of the most important things. So you don't have premature problems there. The other thing is to look at is is when we set them up. If we set the lever uh, height, 
which is what we call deeper in the cover, which would be further down, that actually makes this part, which is where your counterweight goes, it actually brings it up, which makes your counterweight apply slower. So if we set the, the, the lever height higher in the cover to begin with, that moves your lever, or your outside your lever where your counterweight is at, to this position, which actually makes the counterweight come in quicker. So that's another way in which we can control how the counterweight applies, rather than just adding or subtracting the actual weight from the inside or the outside. Now we have the base springs and the base adjusters in place. These springs that you see here are what we call our standard 360 spring. Um, it's, fairly, it's kind of an industry standard. This spring is 52 pounds per quarter inch of compression, which is one of the lighter springs out there in this style clutch. Um, actually what this basically allows for is for us to, where we normally run a ring height of somewhere between, let's say 1.88 and 1.92, it allows us to be approximately around 360 pounds of base. One point, at 1 1.90, we're at 360 pounds of base, and for every one one hundredth up or down, you can add or subtract 12 pounds of pressure. So basically, that means as your disc wears of your clutch, you're actually every one one hundredth that the clutch wears, you're really only losing about 12 pounds of static pressure, which is fairly nominal. The one thing I'd like to take a moment here to start off with to make sure that when you're if you're ever doing this yourself to always make sure um, when you're adjusting your base, whenever you see them flat like this, you'll actually notice that's where there's zero base in it. As you extend the screw outside of the base adjuster cup itself, that's what actually adds base pressure because it actually pushes against the cover and drives the spring downward, compressing it, adding pressure. The big thing you need to make sure is that you're going the right direction. Um, a pot, these don't exactly, and some of them you will see in the industry have a little uh, notch out here on the side, which we do in some of our next gen units and otherwise that allow it to keep from when you go to zero, this cannot actually turn in the spring. However, at 360 pounds of base, generally you've got to put quite a bit of pressure towards it for it to have any kinds of problems as far as being able to turn, um, go in the wrong direction. So once you zero it out on these clutches, this style clutch with a metal cover um, is actually counterclockwise adds base and clockwise removes it. So clockwise screws the, the uh, screw all the way in. Once you go all the way in, you'll feel no pressure. As you start to come back out, you'll find a spot in which you feel just a slight little bit of resistance. That's the point in which you'll start counting for turns of base. So if we say you're going to start at three, that's where you'd start at three turns is where you start to feel the pressure. Um, the biggest problem we see once in a while is someone that's new to it will actually back out the base adjusters not knowing which way to go. You'll notice that in any of our clutches, actually, we will always put... Um, you know, plus and minus on the top of it. We have a, you know, a, a sticker or an engraving, whichever way we need, so that you know which way to go. However, mistakes happen. We've all done it. And if you ever back it all the way out, the trouble is you need to completely disassemble the cover, basically taking the hat off, getting back to this point, so that you can ensure that you're getting the, the screws back into the base adjusters correctly, and that you haven't damaged any of the threads in the aluminum cup. Um, the biggest thing to keep in mind is how many turns that each one has. You can actually put a, this one here is lesser. We only usually recommend about seven turns uh, maximum on one of these. However, you can go more. We can actually put a longer bolt through there. And if you do that, you also need to make sure that a provision is taken on these to where there's a hole drilled in there so that the bolt has a place to go. So that if you go all the way down close to spring bind, that you're not going to be in trouble with that bolt actually making contact with your pressure ring. So basically, it's a, mostly just a geometric or a, you know geometry type of a thing. Uh, you just got to take a look at all those and make sure you don't have any places of interference. But once again, the big thing is to make sure that if you were to ever try to put so much base in this, so to speak, that you back it out and you do, all of a sudden you look in the top of the cover and you're going to notice that you can't see um, where you need to put your Allen key anymore or it's going to be offset to one side, which means that your the bolt has backed out. And at that point, you need to take the cover back off. And of course, that means you need to keep track if it's one that we've set up and we have uh, the exact lever heights and everything set. Keep track of where your shim is at that's going to be found between the top of the yoke and the bottom of the cover, which you'll have to fish out and be careful with. Um, but as long as you take it apart the same way and put it back together, you can reinstall these on your own without a problem at the track in case of a, an uh-oh situation. For note, we want to make sure that everyone knows that the raised, hubs, or raised side of the hub is the side that you want towards the transmission away from the flywheel so that this part here does not actually make contact with your flywheel bolts or any interactions there. Now that we've actually set the cover assembly on top of the pressure ring to the flywheel, the reason we've done this is it actually makes it a little bit easier so that you're able to put your lever bolts down through into your yokes where you need to. 
what we'll actually do at this point is go ahead and tighten uh, the cover down to the flywheel. Normally you're going to see that we're going to put shims beneath here so that we space that up. What we're doing by putting the shims in there and we'll actually take the measurement through this hole in the cover is to actually check your ring height. Ring height is the distance from of the pressure ring to the cover. This, in, this basically ensures that we know exactly what the static spring height is and it's equal all the way around. Once the ring height is set, we can move forward to adjusting the lever heights, which is where we place shim between the yoke and the bottom side of the cover by removing the yoke bolts, placing the shim, and miking accordingly. So now that we have our ring height set, what we've done on this particular unit is we've placed 90 thousandths of shims, which was, in our case, we use this type of a washer. We use It's very common that we use 60 thousandths and 30 thousandths washers. Of course, we have thinner ones such as 10 thou and so on. A little bit more expensive to produce, it's a little bit bigger hassle to try to get right, and honestly within 10 thousandths is not really that in, in, important, um, simply because for every 10 thousandths you're only talking about about 12 pounds of pressure um, to the disc. So it's not at the point which most people would say want to reshim for the wear. Um, 30 is about the point which we do that, so we usually try to supply the clutches with at least one thirty thousand shim in there so that that way after you've worn off three hundreds of uh, clutch you can basically remove one shim and everything's going to go back to where it was so once again the first step to setting one up is setting the ring height the ring height is number one second of all is going to be to set the lever height so that's where we're at now we've left the levers loose for now they're drawn down quite a bit in the cover you'll be able to see but at this point, we'll start tightening them up and start taking measurements to set them properly. The next uh, segment here, we'll show you exactly what that is and where to measure those from uh, and go from there. Now that we have set our ring height, we moved on to lever height. Lever height, once again, is set by placing uh, shim stock, which you'll see here is an assortment. We, make, we, we can get this in various different thicknesses and you can actually use different uh, materials or rounds or different things to get what you want. But generally, small little uh, pieces make pretty big changes as far as your lever height. The uh, lever height, and the easiest way to do this, once again, is to have everything clamped down so that you can then remove this screw from your uh, lever, from your yoke, which allows you to basically move the yoke and everything in there freely without having to chase the pressure plate up and down. Um, Tenzi's uh, tool of choice for this uh, for this video was a uh, basically yeah stick. Uh, which seemed to work pretty good. Uh, basically, she wanted to make a kebab later, I think. But by using it, you can use a punch or anything you have. Once you have this bolt out, to center your hole up down there so that your shim stays where you want. Simply lift up on the end of the lever, bring the yoke up to meet the cover, sandwiching your shims between the top of the yoke and the bottom of the cover, and you're in good, yeah, well, you're in good shape there. Go ahead and screw your screw back in, and you can tighten it down. In order to uh, take a measurement there's two different types of covers that are very prominent in the stamp steel world uh, this is an 11 inch cover or also used a lot with the 10 and a half inch pressure rings so this style here uh, you actually we take the measurement between the top leading edge of the lever and the bottom of the cover which Tinsey is going to demonstrate So there you can see what that measurement will be. We usually on most applications are going to aim somewhere between 0.280 to 0.350. Um, it just depends on what your application is. We can vary that based off of other information and data for your application. However, once again, we do keep them all within six to seven thousandths of each other. Um, and then the other style cover you'll see is a 10 inch cover. Um, I will say the most common one that you'll see out there would probably be that of a McLeod or something along those lines. Um, that cover has a raised hump right above where the lever is. It makes it difficult to get that same uh, number there and this is a little bit more of a challenge but the easy way to do that is to lay your uh, machine a straight edge from one side of the cover to the other and measure down right to that same point which is right beside where the lever and the, uh, is underneath the cover. But if you measure right down there one inch flat it would be the same as 0 .300 on this style cover. So if you were to say want to go instead if you wanted 320 on this cover and you're doing a 10 inch 1.020 would be exactly where you'd want to be. Um, it's just basically you're having to add in about 700 thousandths of additional lift from the bottom edge of the cover up to the top edge of the cover is that number.